the book of Acts, week 15 this week. Last week, we reconnected with Peter. You remember that uh, in Matthew 18, Jesus had given Peter the keys to the kingdom, meaning he'd be influential in, in building the church. He was the one leading each phase of the expansion of the church. When he preached at Pentecost in Jerusalem, when he continued to preach the message of the gospel there in the temple, the, the gospel expanded from Jerusalem to Judea, just as the Lord had said it would in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You'll be my witnesses, and you'll, you'll uh, be my witnesses, and this gospel is going to be preached where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. So Peter was there in the advancement of Jerusalem, Judea. He went to Samaria, where Philip the evangelist had had a, a great harvest, and Peter went to connect the Samaritan church to the Jerusalem church because there was some division there, and he went that the Spirit might come on those, so he was part of that. And now we're going to see that Peter is going to be, in Acts chapter 10, bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. Now remember that although Peter was the, the, the CEO or the leader of the church, he wasn't just hanging out in Jerusalem. He wasn't saying, well, I need to be back here taking care of things. He was doing what all the other disciples, all the other believers were doing. He was going out. He was following the example of Jesus in Matthew 9 where it says, Jesus went about to all the towns and villages, anywhere that there were people, not just large gatherings, but anywhere there were people that needed to hear the gospel, Peter was doing the same thing Jesus did. He was going, and he was going, uh, not only following Jesus' example, but he was going as an example to every believer, including us. We have to be out among people. We can't hibernate in our, in our church, or we can't hibernate in our homes, but we have to get on the playing field. You remember last week we said it's much easier for God to use us if we're already in motion. It's easier to keep something in motion moving and easier to steer or direct something or someone who is in motion. So last week we finished up in chapter 9. Peter's preaching the gospel. While he's preaching the gospel, God is using him miraculously to authenticate the gospel. You remember that he went to, uh, to Leda and he healed Aeneas, the crippled man, and then he raised uh, Dorcas in, in Joppa. Both of those miracles resulted in many people coming to faith in Christ. Now, let me stop here and make sure to remind us, Peter was not some type of superhero saint. Uh, Peter, Peter was no greater than any other follower. What was different about Peter is that he was available. We have to create margin in our work and in our lives. We have to create some margin. We have to leave some, some room to be available uh, for God to use us. Peter was out among uh, people. He wasn't sitting on the sidelines. He was just the vessel. Peter was not the healer. He made clear that it was the power of Jesus that was at work. You remember that he prayed and he declared that Jesus was the healer before each of these miracles. Well, now in chapter 10, here comes that next advancement. In chapter 10, we're going to see Peter's encounter with Cornelius. Cornelius is a Gentile. The gospel is going to go to the Gentiles. Paul is the one who is rapidly going to advance the gospel, but Peter is the one who will open the door um, to this last phase of the expansion of the gospel. Now, God has already been working on Peter because of Peter's prejudice. Peter was a Jew. Peter would not associate with Gentiles. In fact, there's problems even after this encounter when God makes clear to him that he is to do that. He is to take the gospel to the Gentiles. Peter had some prejudice, and he, he's struggling with that, but we see God's already beginning to work on him. If you look at the very last verse of chapter 9, after he is healed, uh, Dorcas or Tabitha there in Joppa, it says that he stayed at the home of Simon the Tanner. Now, a tanner even though Simon was also a Jew, a tanner was not someone you'd want to hang around with, especially if you were a Jew who frequently went to the temple. You see, a tanner was ceremonially, ceremonially unclean. Why? Because he dealt with dead animals. He was always unclean because he was always dealing with dead animals. Not only that, a tanner was not allowed to reside in town. He had to reside on the outskirts of town downwind from the town because of all the dead and rotting carcasses around his place of business. And yet we see at the end of chapter 9 that Peter is staying there in the home of Simon the Tanner. That's very significant. Peter is now also beginning to model Christ in, in the fact that he's beginning to associate with the outcasts of society. And that's important because the Jews are even greater outcasts or excuse me, the Gentiles are even greater outcasts than the Jewish outcasts. 
And so Peter's going to learn here that God accepts uh, the Gentiles. Peter's also going to learn that God expects him uh, to accept the Gentiles and even to have fellowship with them. You see, that's the true sign of, of being someone who is accepting, that you're willing to have fellowship with them. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this this morning, um, but obviously part of the message in chapter 10 is about prejudice. And there is still in our day, maybe not as much as there used to be, there's still in our day some prejudice even within the body of Christ. And God has made it clear that anyone who is a follower of Christ, anyone who has come to faith in Christ, is to be accepted by the entire body. We're not to exclude anyone. I was talking with a friend this week, and he was mentioning that his mother had made a comment, and he got on to her um, about being prejudiced because of the comment she made. And her immediate response, and I've heard this before, her immediate response is, I'm not prejudiced at all. I have several back black friends. And he said, well, name one. She could name an acquaintance or two, a first name, but no real friends. You see, the real example of acceptance and friendship is that we are involved in the lives of people. We have fellowship with people. Listen, I have several black friends. I've been to CC's Chicken and Waffles over off Roosevelt, and I was the only white person in there, and that's okay, and I don't like chicken and waffles, and that's okay. I mean, that's, that's just an odd smash-up, isn't it? Chicken and waffles. But my point is, I have fellowship with people of color, and I'm fine with that. Don't think you're not a prejudiced person, you're not a racial person, just because you know somebody of a different skin color and you can say their name. Peter was going to have to learn that accepting someone includes having fellowship with them, being a part of their lives. Look with me in Acts chapter 10 this morning. I'm not going to have time to read the entire chapter. I hope you'll take time to do that. I'm going to read the first 20-some verses and then kind of skim um, to give you the gist of the story. Acts chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a servant of what was known as the Italian cohort. A devout man who feared God with all his household, he gave alms generously to the people and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius, and he stared at him in terror and said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers, your alms have been accepted as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with Simon the Tanner whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him, and having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, as they were on their journey approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat, but while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opening and something like a great sheet descending being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air, and there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, What God has made clean do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Now while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you're looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them in to be his guests, which is fascinating. They were Gentiles. He and the other Simon were both Jews, and yet they invited these Gentiles into their home. Verse 23 says he went with them. Verse 24, Cornelius, when, when he arrived four days later, had been expecting him. He'd, he'd brought all his relatives and friends uh, notice in verse 25, when Peter entered, Cornelius met him, fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter looked at him up saying, stand up, for I too am a man. And Peter mentions in verse 28 the fact that it was unlawful religiously for a Jew to associate or visit with anyone of another nation, a Gentile. 
but God has shown me I should not call any person common or unclean. And so he asked him, why, why have you sent for me? Cornelius relates the vision that he had, and he says, now we've sent for you. We're all here, verse 38, 33, in the presence of God, to hear all you've been commanded by the Lord. So starting in verse 34, Peter unpacks the gospel for them, and we'll get to a summary of that in just a few minutes, but he explains the gospel to them. And verse 44 says, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. Well, what does that tell us? They had believed. They had accepted. And so then down in verse 47, uh, Peter asks the question, is there any reason we would not baptize these people who've received the Holy Spirit? And then he commands them to be baptized. He stays with them for a few days. So this is a critical juncture in the early church. Once this final barrier, the barrier between Jew and Gentile, is breached, the gospel is able to rapidly advance to the rest of the world. And, and it's why you and I are here today, because the gospel, God sent the Jews, sent Peter, sent Paul to get the gospel to the Gentiles, and that's why we're here. Now, I don't want to overstate the obvious about the story, but clearly you see God's hand in this. The visions that, that he gave Cornelius, the vision that he gave Peter, the timing of that, right as Peter was coming out of that trance and trying to figure out what does this vision mean, three men knock at the gate and, and call for Peter, and he's just been told that he's not to call anything that God has made common or unclean. All of the details show God's clear hand in this. Now, you could look at the story of Cornelius and say, well, that's, that's really cool that God did that that way, but God doesn't speak in visions today. Maybe he does. But just because you haven't had a vision from God, please don't say that God doesn't speak. God speaks. God doesn't speak just to people like Peter. God doesn't speak just to the apostles. God doesn't just speak to pastors and preachers and missionaries. God speaks to every individual believer. You need to be listening. God may speak to you and call you like he called Philip to go somewhere, and you don't know where you're going, you don't know the purpose, but if he speaks and he calls you to go, you need to go because God's at work and he's going to use you. God speaks just like he spoke to Peter. There are people today that God speaks to in visions. I'm not going to speak to that, the validity of that. There are so many fakers out there. That's not important. What's important to understand is God does speak. There are a lot of ways he can speak. Primarily, he speaks to his word. Anything he speaks better match up to his word. But when the Holy Spirit of God who lives in you, and it's not necessarily going to be an audible voice, I guess it could be, but when the Holy Spirit of God who lives in you speaks to your soul or speaks to your spirit and tells you to do something, Thing. Don't say God doesn't speak. The problem is not whether God speaks. The problem is whether or not we listen. We need to listen and obey when he speaks. Cornelius is a Gentile, but he's a really good person. He's a Roman. What do we know about the Romans? The Romans were pagan idolaters. They, they worshiped many gods. They had many different temples, temples to all these different gods. But Cornelius, even as a Roman, had turned away from the idolatry of his nation. In fact, Luke tells us in that second verse of chapter 10, he and his family were devout and God-fearing. God-fearing not meaning they were afraid of God, but they had an incredible um, respect and, and, and reverence toward God. We see that Roman, uh, Cornelius was a Roman centurion. What does that mean? Well, he was a military commander. He's stationed in Caesarea. Caesarea is the Roman capital of Judea, and it's a trouble spot in the empire because that was the place most often when the Jews were rising up against the Roman Empire, that was the place where trouble broke out. And so these, the, the Italian regiment was sent there to maintain the domination of Rome over the Jewish people. So you can imagine as a centurion, um, Cornelius could have used his power in a very abusive way toward the Jews, but you see in verse 22 it says that he was respected by the Jewish people. That tells you a great deal about this man's character. He was a good man. We also read there were three cardinal disciplines. There are three cardinal disciplines of the Jewish faith, prayer, fasting, and the giving of alms. We read in the second and third verse there of chapter 10 that Cornelius prayed, and he gave alms. It doesn't mention fasting, but that's obviously a possibility. The point is, he was disciplined in the same way the Jews were. He did a lot for the poor. Now, you can imagine with his command uh, as a centurion, Cornelius was a very busy man, but he found time to minister to the needs of the poor in the community where he lived, and he found time to pray. 
we read that he prayed uh, regularly or he prayed continually to God. Cornelius prayed three times a day just like the Jews did. In fact, when the vision came, it says he's praying at the ninth hour. That was at three in the afternoon. That was the third prayer time of the day when he was praying that God gave him this vision. And it's interesting as he prayed, the word where it says he prayed and it was the ninth hour, that word for prayer there means to beg for something that is indispensable. You see, Cornelius knew even growing up in a culture that worshiped all these different gods, he knew that something was missing, that there had to be something more. And so he turned from those gods and he rejected those gods, but he didn't yet know the true and living God. So here's Cornelius. He's exceptionally just. He's God-fearing. He's greatly respected. Everybody, and specifically those in the, in the Jewish communi- community, said, you know, this Cornelius is a really good guy. Let me ask you a question this morning. Have you ever known someone who was not a Christian, not a follower, not a disciple of Christ? Have you ever known someone who was not a believer that was a really good person? Maybe you've known someone that was a really good person, and, and in fact, their personal conduct and their attitude was even better than some Christians you know. Cornelius was such a good man. He was kind. He was considerate. He put others before himself. He did a lot of good works. Surely a man like Cornelius has a place in heaven, right? Nope. You see, the truth revealed in this passage is that despite all his good works, Cornelius needed to be saved, and the only way he was going to be saved was to hear the message of the gospel. In chapter 11, and we're not going to get to this this morning, but in chapter 11, Peter has gone back to Jerusalem to explain what has happened because the Jerusalem Jews, believers, are up in arms that he had this this encounter with these Gentiles. But when he's explaining what happened in chapter 11, it's basically a recount of what you see here in chapter 10. In chapter 11, verse 14, he mentions that the angel told Cornelius to bring Peter because Peter would bring him the message through which he would be saved. So Cornelius, despite all his goodness and all his good deeds, was not saved until Peter came with a message. The men here in chapter 10, the men who came to Joppa, and when Peter said, why have you come? This is what they said, an angel directed Cornelius to send for you. You know, the meaning of the Greek word that that here is translated directed includes the idea of a warning. When that angel showed up to Cornelius in that, in that vision Cornelius had in the first part of chapter 10, that angel was not coming to congratulate him for being such a good person and doing so many good things. He wasn't coming to congratulate him. He was coming to warn him. God had noticed all the good things about Cornelius, but Cornelius did not know God, and the angel was coming to warn him that he needed the gospel. Why? Because as good a person as Cornelius was, he was still a sinner. Every sinner deserves the punishment of an eternal death, an eternal separation from God in a place called hell. Well, what about Cornelius' good works? Not good enough. Our good works can never cover our sin well enough to make us acceptable to God. If there's sin in your life, there is no good work that can cover that sin or pay for that sin. So Cornelius is warned. And you know, in the same way, God could be warning someone here today. I had a hard time sleeping last night because I kept running over in my mind about what a great person Cornelius was and how easy it would have been for him to be deceived. If God had not sent that angel to warn him, he would have been deceived right into an eternal separation from God. I don't want anyone that ever hears a gospel from me to be deceived into thinking that they're good enough and they don't need the sacrifice that Christ has made. So Cornelius is warned and he obeys. He immediately sends his, the, these three men, his most trusted men, to bring Peter so that he can hear the message that God has for him. Well, what happens? Right as those men are getting into Joppa, Peter is on the roof uh, of Simon's house, Simon the Tanner. That was not an uncommon place. Usually these roofs had uh, awnings on them, but he was up on the roof, probably where he could get some breeze, get away from the stench. And he's up there, and it's about the sixth hour, which is noon, and they're preparing a meal, but he falls into a trance. 
And he sees this sheet lowered, and it contains all kinds of clean and unclean animals, and Peter's told to kill and eat. Three times he's told that. And, of course, he refuses. As a good Jew, he's not going to eat anything unclean, anything that God has prohibited. Now, let me, let me say here, some theologians try to take this passage and say that this is the repeal of the Jewish dietary laws. I, I don't believe that. I don't think you can take this one incidence and say that God has repealed all that. I'm not here to talk about Jewish dietary laws today. I have enough problems with my own with what I eat. But that's not what this is about. What it's about is the sheet was lowered three times to Peter, and immediately after this vision, after this trance, three Gentiles come knocking. God's using this vision. The purpose of the vision is, is, is to get Peter's attention, to teach him something important. He's told that he is to go with these men, that they are sent by God, and Peter's going to learn that Gentiles are not unclean before God. God accepts them as well. In verse 25, we saw that when he walked in the house, Cornelius falls down at his feet in reverence, and Peter's, Peter immediately says, whoa, 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 stand up. I too am a man. What is he saying? I'm no different than you. I'm a man just like you. I'm no more special. I'm not more, no more accepted by God. I'm just like you. And in verse 28, he tells Cornelius and those who are, are gathered there, God has shown me that I should not call any person unclean. And again, in, in the story, we see God's hand at work bringing the seeker and the witness together. He gives each man a vision, and when the men at Peter's gate shows up, when that vision's complete and the men show up and Peter goes with them, what is Cornelius doing back at the ranch? He is gathering his family and friends. They are seeking something more, and God is bringing uh, that witness to them. Now, here's an interesting thought maybe you've never had if you've read the story before. Why didn't God just have the angel tell Cornelius how to be saved? I mean, when the angel showed up, when Cornelius had that vision, the angel showed up, it says that he was terrified. He recognized this was a divine messenger. In fact, he responds, what is it, Lord? I mean, if he knew it was a divine messenger, that angel could have simply told him the gospel, what was necessary to be saved, and that would have been easy and quick and done. Listen, if you look through Scripture, although angels deliver messages from God, there is never a case where an angel taught someone or told someone the gospel. Never happens. For whatever reason, God has chosen to use human instruments. Now, let's be honest an angel would be a whole lot easier because we don't listen, because we're too afraid, because we lack courage, because we're not sure that God can use us. It'd be a lot easier to use an angel, but God's not chosen to do that. If the gospel message is going to get out, it's not going to be because angels visit your friend or your coworker. That's not going to happen. If the gospel message gets out, it's not because a Gideon is standing outside someplace handing out Bibles. That's a good thing to get the Word of God in people's hands, but we've got to open our mouths and speak up the truth of the gospel if people are going to be saved. Beginning of verse 34, Peter explains the gospel. Let me just give you a summary here of what he shares about the gospel. Five things. First of all, he says that Jesus came so that we could have peace with God through him. We can't have peace with God. We can't be made right with God. Our sin cannot be forgiven. Our peace with God comes only through Jesus. The second thing he shares is that he says, look, when Jesus was here on earth, God's anointing was on him. He demonstrated in a practical, human, physical way, he demonstrated the love of God by his actions and by what he said about God. If we know Jesus, we know God because Jesus was God. He mentions that they put him to death on a tree, that, that Jesus died for our sins, but also that he was resurrected. And Peter said, listen, Cornelius, we were witnesses. We saw the resurrected Christ. We interacted with him. We had meals with him. We, we talked with him. We know that this is true. And then Peter goes on and said, he's given us, who's that, his followers, the task of telling everyone about him and warning everyone that one day God will judge us all. What if that friend or coworker doesn't hear the gospel and they stand before God in judgment and they find out that you knew and, and you didn't warn them, you didn't tell them? 
Listen, if you lived down on the river and you knew the flood was coming and your neighbor didn't, shame on you if you didn't tell them they were going to get inundated by floodwaters and lose their lives if they didn't do something. That's what Peter says here. We have to warn them that one day God will judge us all. And then finally, of course, he says those who believe. What does it mean to believe? It's not just intellectual assent, but those who believe, those who put their lives into Christ, they surrender their lives to him, they give their lives to him, they're going to receive forgiveness of sin. And we saw in verse 44, as Cornelius and his family hear that message of the gospel, there's evidence that they believe because they receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the sign that someone is saved. It's the seal that God places on us. It's the guarantee of our inheritance, which is to come. And they receive the Holy Spirit, and and, and they're baptized. Well, let's bring it to a close this morning. What, What is the salvation of Cornelius and his family? What does chapter 10 in Acts say to us today? The most important thing that we need to get from Acts chapter 10 is the understanding that our faith cannot rest on good works. You don't have a relationship with Christ. You're not made right with God because of good works. You're not made right with God because your family is. You're not made right with God because you were brought up in a Christian home. You're not made right with God because you're a member of a church. You're not made right with God because of your religious practices. None of that. And there are many people in church, this church and other churches today, there are many people that are trusting in their good works or the fact they grew up in a Christian family or their granddaddy was a Baptist pastor. I hear that all the time. Or they're very religious. They attend church every week. They read the Bible. They pray. That's all good. That's things that believers ought to be doing. But it's only a surrender to Christ that brings a person to saving faith. If you're counting on the things that you do, even your religious practice, to save you, then you're saying, God, I don't need you. Jesus, I don't need the sacrifice you made. I got this. I can do it myself. And Scripture is clear that you cannot. The second thing that this passage speaks to us about for those um, those who know Christ, we need to be reminded that, that God is going to call us to join him in his work. But as I said a couple of weeks ago, God doesn't send us out alone. God doesn't send us out ahead. When God calls us to join him, he's already working. God was working in Cornelius. Cornelius was already seeking God when God called Peter to go. God is working in the hearts of unbelievers to cause them to seek him, and when they're seeking him, that's when God calls us to join him. He sends people. He doesn't send angels with the message of the gospel. He sends people. We always need to be on the lookout for those opportunities. And you may think, well, I don't don't know a lost person. I don't know anybody that's seeking. You need to get some time with the Lord. You need to make yourself available you need to make sure that the Lord knows that you're ready and you're willing and be on the lookout. The opportunities are there. I can't tell you how many times when I was in college I would do something so foolish. I would pray, Lord, well, just give me an opportunity today. And sometime that afternoon I'd recognize an opportunity I'd miss that morning. I'd, I'd say the prayer, but I wouldn't have my eyes open spiritually. I wouldn't be looking for people in need. God is working in the lives of people to cause him to seek him, and then he's going to call us, just like he did Peter, to go and give the message of the gospel. Listen, there's a lot of good people in the world today. A lot of good people in the world. Maybe not as devout as Cornelius, but, but good people. And good people often think they don't need Jesus' sacrifice for them. Good people often think that, that God wouldn't destroy them because they're a good person. The problem with that kind of thinking is they're trusting in their own moral goodness to be enough, and man's moral goodness will never be enough. We need to be careful that we don't assume that our good neighbor, our good coworker, or even our good family member knows Christ. We need to ask them. God is working in the hearts of people to cause them to seek him. He's not going to send a message through somebody else. It's through me and through you and the relationships we have with those around us.